hello everyone. Welcome to this event by the Oxford Climate Society on Green Nudges for Promoting Sustainability During COVID. My name is Charlie. I'm an alumni of Keller College and I'm part of OCS Action Team. I'm chairing this event today together with Ellie Halton. Ellie is doing a DPhil in neuroscience at New College and she leads the Oxford Climate Society Action Team. Oxford Climate Society is a student society that runs weekly events all around climate change, the eight-week Oxford School of Climate Change, and engages with the university on net zero policies and incorporating climate change into the curriculum. This event is part of our sustainability action workshop series, where we talk about the practical climate actions colleges and departments can take. Our speaker for this event is Zach Bainham Hurt from the Behavioral Insight Team, BIT for short. Zach is an advisor in BIT's energy and sustainability team, where he applies behavioral insights to help decarbonize the economy, promote sustainable consumption, and protect the environment. Um, awareness and interest in climate action is rising these days, but there's also concerns around um, health with the coronavirus pandemic. So people sometimes find themselves torn between sustainable behavior and behavior that maximi maximizes health and safety. So today, Zach will give an introduction to using behavioral science insights for sustainable action and will discuss some easy but effective and importantly COVID compatible steps staff and students can take to support sustainability. Thank you very much, Charlie, for the introduction and Ellie um, and Charlie for having me. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, okay, so I'm gonna um, share my screen um, and maybe Charlie, let me know. You can't see it. So, yeah, I think that's fine. So yeah. the purpose of this talk um, is to kind of give an overview of, of green nudges, um, but more generally applying behavioral insights and behavior science to promote more sustainable behaviors. And I hope some of these um, insights that I'm going to cover today are relevant to you right now during COVID. Um, but I haven't been to a university in a few years, and I don't know exactly if all of them is that will be. Um, but I hope the principles you should be able to apply long after COVID, or at least long after this current um, period of challenge. So to get us started, how do we make decisions? Now, the, the key point here is that we don't simply have some inherent sort of preference. We don't really know exactly what we want for lunch. Our decisions and what we choose for lunch are not entirely dependent upon our levels of, of knowledge or attitudes or our values or um, the trade-offs in the cost benefits. Of course, all of those things are important, but there's also other things that influence our decision-making. For instance, let's start with a little, little quiz or game. Um, maybe put in the chat if you can, um, or just think to yourself if you can't. You pop into a coffee shop, uh, maybe when lockdown ends, and you are faced with three choices. Now, which coffee do you pick? The small, medium, or the large? If you could put it in the chat, just put it, yeah, put it in the chat. Um, if you're anything like me, you probably go with the middle one. Um, maybe I'm, you know, I need a, a caffeine boost, but that large one looks like slightly ridiculously sized coffee. I probably don't choose that. I go with the middle of the road option. That seems quite sensible. Now I go into another shop a few months later and I'm asked, which coffee do I want? Now, again, if you're anything like me, I'd probably go, well, I don't want that, that incredibly large coffee. That seems too much, but obviously I, I am quite thirsty. So I'll probably go the middle road option. I'll go pick the middle choice. Now we do that quite a lot. And the point here is that whilst we have some sort of understanding of maybe our, our need, what, what kind of coffee we want, maybe our price range and, and what um, our desire for caffeine is, we're also heavily influenced about how the choice is presented the physical environment around us when we're making the choice. And this means that small changes to that environment can heavily influence the decisions that we make. Again, if I ask you if you, I mean, I don't really wear a suit prior to COVID anyway, but um, I certainly haven't during lockdown. But if you did go into a suit shop and you ask the question, which suit out of these three options would you pick, the left, middle or the right, which one would you go for? Again, maybe chuck in the chat if you, you can. And I don't know, maybe you've guessed that this could be a, a trick question. Um, and you would be right if you thought that. 
each of these suits is exactly the same, it's the same suit. But if this was an experiment, I asked you in the suit shop, which suit, or I asked you in the experiment, which of these suits would you pick? If someone else in the group said, I think B is the best suit, you'd be much more likely to also choose B. But in fact, in this experiment, and from the 60s, I think you're almost double as likely. And the key insight here is that we are heavily influenced by our physical environment, but also our social environment. We are social animals and we often like to follow the behaviors of others, or at least we're influenced by what other people are doing, or at least what we think other people are doing. Now, trying to bring some of these insights together, Daniel Kahneman, um, the Nobel laureate in economics, although he's a psychologist, came up with two sort of a, kind of like a, almost like a metaphor to describe how we make decisions. And these, he uses two systems of behavior. The first system is our fast, automatic, intuitive, effortless uh, decision-making. This is the kind of behaviors that we do when we maybe we're faced with a, an immediate threat. This is kind of like our fight or flight response. This is what we do when we're driving or maybe cycling and, and we're well used to going down a particular route and we, we make our, our turns or we pull out um, automatically without thinking. This is what we do if I asked you what's two times four, you probably automatically think of eight. But we're also influenced by our system too, which is our, our slower thinking. This is our more reflective, um, deliberative, analytic. This is perhaps what we decide to do once we've cooled off from an argument or maybe when we're learning to drive or learning something new, it's much more tiring. It's really cognitively demanding, requires a lot of effort. Likewise, unless you're an absolute whiz, if I said, what, 17 times 13, um, or if anything like me, it doesn't immediately spring to mind. Um, it requires a lot of effort to work that out. And kind of the idea of thinking about these two different, different systems of behavior is that although we like to think often we are in, sort of acting entirely um, rationally, entirely under system two, when we're maybe choosing, choosing our choice of lunch or choosing whether to sort of be green or not, or do a particular behavior. Often it turns out that actually we are either making our decision based upon more like system one thinking, it's more automatic, intuitive, or at least we're heavily influenced by system one as well as system two. Now, amongst other people, the behavioral insights team was set up in 2010 to kind of apply some of these ideas from behavior science to government policy. So it was formed in the cabinet office, part of the UK government in 2010. Subsequently, um, it spun out and it's now a sort of co-owned organization, sort of co-owned partly by the cabinet office, but also we, we are um, half private, in fact, I think a third private. And we work with organizations all over the world. We have offices all over the world. And like kind of behavioral insights, generally our work is spread across, across the globe. I think we run something like 500 trials trying to apply um, randomized control trials and other forms of experiments to test what kind of behavioral interventions work in the public policy um, domain. But these insights go much beyond um, simply nudging. So what a nudge is, or one definition of a nudge is changing the context in which a choice is made without restricting the choice itself. So it's a bit like rather than telling someone that you can only have one particular option for lunch or maybe incentivizing them um, which choice to pick, you maybe you rearrange the choices in the canteen. For instance, maybe the people are more likely to pick the first option they come to. So maybe you put the healthier options first. Or likewise, maybe people are more inclined to pick a vegetarian option um, if there's more of those available. So maybe you increase the amount of vegetarian options. So that's kind of what a nudge is. is generally, you don't restrict choice. But also, behavioral insights go, go far beyond just nudging. So um, in the poll at the beginning, the, the nudging questions would go more towards this sort of environment design or maybe putting default settings, such as maybe what's your, um, rather than opting out of something like organ donation, maybe, or maybe your pension scheme, um, rather than opting in, sorry, you change it to an opt out. So you still um, can, not donate your um, organ if you don't want to, um, but by changing that default setting, maybe you change what people do. So, so nudging probably fits within environment design, 
in some people's definition within information provision. But there's much more you can do to apply this understanding of, of human behavior, this system one and system two thinking, to all sorts of different tools to influence sustainable behaviors. So these can be changing an actual process, maybe how someone signs up to a, maybe a bike sharing scheme. Maybe if you make it much easier, um, maybe people are more likely to sign up. Likewise, this might be applying incentives, and these could be social incentives or financial incentives. Or of course, we have the traditional rules and regulations and, and enforcement. And the key sort of takeaway here is that behavioral insights and the principles behind nudging can be applied to all of these different tools. And within the context of a college, I'm sure all of these different tools will be um, within the arsenal. Okay, so that's kind of a little background to behavioral insights and maybe um, sort of behavior science more generally. And now I'm gonna take you through some more practical applications, which have been um, largely picked out of a, a book we helped to produce alongside the UN Environment Program, recently called The Little Book of Green Nudges. And these are a range of interventions which have actually been sort of tried and tested in campuses across the world and which could be relevant um, here today during COVID. And as we go through, I've, I've highlighted in green the ones which I think probably most relevant now, at least my sort of perception of those, and then in orange ones which maybe aren't particularly relevant now, um, but the principle um, is probably quite important to take forward. And as we go through, these interventions are sort of largely based around this framework that we developed at um, the Pavel Insights team called the EAST framework. And this is probably, um, if you could take one thing away from the talk, probably take this away, that if you want to change behavior, it's important to make it as easy as possible, as attractive as possible, harness our, our social um, inclinations and to intervene in a timely manner. So this is EAST, easy, attractive, social and timely. Okay, so first, how to change behavior by making it easy. Now in the background of this slide um, is what's known as the desire path. These are the paths that are formed when people don't take the maybe the paved path and they cut across the grass. And it's quite a good illustration of the fact that as humans, we often take the path of least resistance. It's just kind of a reality. We all do it, I do it the whole time. Um, we tend to get put off by things that have slightly small frictions, that things are slightly, a little bit of hassle, we, we tend to put it off and we don't do it. And we tend to take the path of least resistance. So understanding that, we can try and sort of change how we influence behavior by making it as easy as possible and going with the grain of human behavior. So one way to do this is to set green defaults. For instance, a default may describe just sort of like the pre-setting. So, if you're anything like me, um, you probably haven't changed the ringtone on your phone. Now, ringtone is an example of a, of a default. You could change it. There's lots of options. I just haven't got around to it. And so the preset option is the one that I've gone with. Likewise, there's lots of preset options which we could change, but we don't tend to change. So changing those can actually have quite a, a large impact on our um, sustain sustainability. So it may be changing all of our appliances to being default green setting. It may be changing our and the meals offered in college to be sort of meat-free defaults where you opt in to the meat option as opposed to opting out. It could be as much as possible, maybe beyond COVID, trying to have default um, virtual first meetings, which I'm not so sure in, in a college scenario how much that would save energy, but certainly um, international meetings, conferences, that kind of thing. And it's very important. Another default I've mentioned here in orange is is a default around bringing your own containers into cafeterias and, and that such that possibly not so relevant right now, um, but in the future and uh, beyond COVID, quite important. So wherever there is a default setting, think about the ways you can maybe change that to be a slightly more environmentally um, friendly default setting. And again, the, you're not trying to um, restrict people's choice. It's just, if there's got to be a default setting, you might as well make it the one which is the greenest if, you can, if there's no other um, problem with that. A nice example here um, from the book is Portland Community College. They decided to automatically shut down computers overnight and just change this to port setting to that. Um, it was quite a simple change, but saved thousands of kilowatt hours of electricity. And a, sort of an interesting thing here is that previously they tried 
prompting people emails, information on, on saving electricity, which didn't work. Um, making it easy by defaulting people into it seemed to work uh, more effectively. Likewise, we've talked about this a little bit um, and how we're influenced by the choice um, architecture. That's sort of how the, the choice is made, how it's presented to us. And we can make things a lot easier to do if we provide more infrastructure to do it. See, that sounds quite um, easy to say, but is also quite effective. So the more um, easy it is to just so maybe keep your bike in, in college, the more the racks there are, for instance, um, in or outside of college, the more you're going to use your bike. Likewise, the more meat-free options there are, this has been shown in some cool studies in the University of Cambridge, um, the more people choose the meat-free option. But this could also apply to actually making green options more prominent. Like if you think about when you go into a supermarket, there's a reason why um, sort of chocolate and things like that are placed at the till because it makes it easy for us to get it. Um, and it's probably quite expensive to put them there because um, we don't necessarily go into the shop deciding we want to buy chewing gum, but when it's there um, at the till, we maybe put it in our basket. That's not uh, changed the, the, the ability of us to, to pick um, chewing gum, for instance, it hasn't made a rule against it or for it, but it has changed the way the choice is presented and made it more easier for us to choose that. And that's often why we do. Likewise, as I mentioned previously, simply making something slightly harder to do or a green behavior slightly easier to do will make it more likely that people do it. So another nice example would be to make it harder to leave taps running. Again, it seems quite small, but if you do this across scale and um, by putting um, sort of automatic settings and, and, and timeouts, that kind of thing. Likewise, other small nudges, which have been effect for, um, effective in the past, which may not be applicable right now during COVID, but things like in a cafeteria, if you give people a smaller tray, and no tray or give them a smaller plate, they tend to take less and, and waste less as a result. Um, that's because often when we think we are in a buffet, we tend to put lots of stuff on our plate because we don't want to have to come back. Um, so we often put more food than we actually use. Likewise, just making it easier to access the green infrastructure that we have, make it much more likely that people um, actually use it. So again, another nice example here from Cork in Ireland was the introduction of um, re reusable cup um, washing facilities, which led to an actual increase in re uh, reusable cup use. So again, wherever you've got some behavior that you're trying to get people to do, maybe it's to use um, reusable cups or anything else that might be novel now during COVID, try and think about ways you can actually make that slightly easier to do or ways to make the reverse behavior slightly harder to do. Okay, so the second key principle here from the EAST framework, how can we make either the green behavior more attractive or how can we at least attract attention to it? So in the background of this slide is Melbourne train station a few years ago, where during the course of a summer, some artists painted a nice sort of floral installation, art installation on the stairs. And this had the interesting effect of making it much more likely that people took the stairs, particularly in rush hour, than taking the escalator. Didn't change anything about the sort of benefits of taking stairs in terms of the fitness or anything like that. Um, didn't make the stairs any, any faster to get up, but they just made it more attractive, made it nicer. Likewise, we can use that same principle to make even small things such as our green infrastructure, our recycling facilities, um, much nicer. If you have a prettier bin, people are probably going to use it more. It seems silly, but it's true. Likewise, other ways to attract attention, which have been um, shown to be quite effective, is providing people with live updates so on, and, and feedback. So this has been used in the home, um, like thermostats, smart thermostats, that can tell you your energy usage. Likewise, you can do this in college. You can have a big, a big screen, telling people about live energy usage in, in different areas um, and providing that feedback to attract attention to it. The word we, we use quite a lot um, is salience. So how can you make, attract, make something more salient, which is maybe make it more like eye grabbing or at least attract attention to it. And other things we can do to attract people's attention is things like personalizing messages. This is used quite a lot in, in marketing, um, maybe even possibly too much now, but it's certainly, novel ways to attract people's attention 
actually does attract people's attention. It's useful to bear in mind. Likewise, this is quite an important insight which is born out of um, some experiments that we've been running. It's the importance of using positive framings when trying to encourage green behaviors. Now there's obviously, is a role for highlighting um, the sort of urgency of, of environmental action and the problems that emerge. There's also quite a strong argument for and actually trying to encourage particular behaviors to use positive messaging and positive framing. So one way to do that is to highlight the co-benefits of a green behavior. So rather than strictly maybe focusing on the, the damage, environmental damage it's, it's avoiding, focus on either the benefits to the environment or focus on maybe the benefits to something else. So for instance, um, the fitness benefits of cycling is quite a good way to get people to adopt um, greener travel behaviors. Likewise, in an experiment that we ran with the Wild Resource Institute, we were testing what kind of language on, on menus and cafes makes, makes more likely people choose vegetarian options. And the key insight here is that describing sort of the Make it, making things sound a bit more attractive, describing the, the sort of using indulgent language or describing the provenance of the product, they may be calling a chickpea curry comforting or field grown, makes it much more likely that people actually choose that option than if you simply call it the meat free option. So rather than focusing on what's been taken away, focus on what's been added. This can boost, in this case, it boosts the sales of veggie options. So maybe think about, um, I'm not sure exactly how this you may apply this in, in college, but definitely try and think about using sort of more attractive uh, language where you can. And other things you can do is think about the group pride identities and maybe even competitions between colleges. This sort of brings us on quite nicely to the importance of incentives. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that the physical environment and our social environment heavily influences what we do. And of course, also the incentives at play influence what we do. Now, this can be purely financial incentives. So if you give people discounts from taking their reusable coffee cup, probably likely more people are going to use a reusable coffee cup or container. We found this um, to be the case in the Solomon Islands in some schools that we're doing um, some interventions for. So these in this image, this is previously the, the every day the school lunch was handed out in these containers. And then we shifted this to um, rewarding people for bringing in their own containers and getting a slight discount on the lunch. Likewise, you might be able to introduce things like meal deals to sort of draw upon actual financial incentives, but, and, and maybe even things like um, deposits return schemes. Quite a nice insight is wherever you're doing some kind of intervention, we often actually respond better to things like lotteries than pure um, sort of a pure payoff. So maybe the, the chance, even if it's a slim one, of, of winning 100 pounds or 500 pounds might be more likely to influence our behavior than the, sort of the certainty of getting 50p off or something like that in some cases. But this might not be possible in, in, in college. It might not be possible in, term, in, in times of COVID. Um, but so you can th often think about other forms of incentives such as gamification, where there's no monetary thing involved, but you simply adding some sort of competitive element of some kind of behavior you can do. And maybe people are rewarded with social kudos or prestige. These are quite high, high motivators for our actions. Okay, so the, the third key principle from the EAST framework is how to harness our, our social inclinations. We're social animals. If in this picture, if you stand in a crowd and you point upwards, even now if I point upwards on my screen, you're probably half inclined to want to look upwards. We tend to follow what other people are doing. Now there's probably very good evolutionary and sort of social psychology reasons for doing this. For instance, um, in an emergency situation, it's probably better just to follow what other people are doing rather than try and work out the legitimacy of a threat or a danger ourselves. Likewise, we tend to presume that other people may have knowledge that we don't. So if 500 people have gone to a particular restaurant and only five to another one, we might assume Maybe the 500 people had something they knew that I didn't, so I'll, I'll follow what they did. Regardless of the, the reason, it's very well established that we are heavily influenced by the behaviors of others. So it's really important to, to bear in mind that this can be 
have a positive effect on encouraging environmental behavior and a negative one. So if you um, describe a positive social norm, so this is something if you say 90% you know, of people are doing something really great for the environment, or if you describe a dynamic norm, which is describing an increasing proportion of people are doing something great for the environment, that's probably gonna have a positive effect on more people doing that thing. Whereas if you say millions of people are doing this bad thing, we need to stop that happening. It's implicitly telling people that that bad thing is quite normal and lots of people are doing it. And that might actually make you more likely to do that thing. So what can we do with this information? Well, we can try and highlight wherever other people are doing green behaviors or whether the, where those behaviors are increasing. If we highlight those, those norms, those green norms, we can encourage others to do the same. So one quite nice way to do this is to show people what, what their sort of energy or water consumption usage is. Typically, when you tell people who have longer than average shower times, this case is from the University of Bath, people then reduce their shower time. This is the same um, finding being found in terms of energy um, usage in, in lots of countries. The flip side is if you tell people who currently maybe consume a bit less than average, that they are consuming a bit less, they may also change their consumption to fit with the norm. So you have to be quite careful with thinking about norms. But it is, regardless, it's very often quite a good idea to share information about positive trends and to try and um, encourage people by sharing what good things people are doing elsewhere. Um, likewise, as well as being heavily influenced by uh, just sort of people generally, we are particularly influenced by certain um, certain individuals. I guess in modern parlance, maybe we call these influencers. Um, but it's, it's in, useful to sort of acknowledge this because some people, some messengers, are going to have be more effective than others. So as well as the message, the messenger is important. And things to think about here are, is how can you sort of broaden the appeal of a message to maybe um, appeal to those who, who aren't necessarily identifying as people who do a given behavior. So you, may, you might have a segment um, of the college, could be a very large one who, who, who perceive themselves to be um, sort of passionate environmental um, sort of sustainable individuals, but you might have those who don't see themselves as that. And to appeal to those, you might have to appeal with slightly different language, sort of broaden, um, broaden the appeal of who you're targeting. Likewise, it's often useful to use as, as effective and trusted messages as possible. Um, there's kind of slightly anecdotal evidence that David Attenborough's sort of appeal in Blue Planet 2 was behind the large decrease in, in, in and sort of demand for reductions in plastic straws and that kind of thing. Um, it's quite cor uh, correlative evidence, but I think it's quite strong. I think it's quite intuitive that we tend to listen to some people over others, and it's quite important when you're sending out communications to bear that in mind. And likewise, the last thing to talk about in terms of our, our sort of social tendencies is that we, as well as we're influenced by what other people around us are doing, we're heavily influenced by what we think other people think of us. So we, we like to be consistent. So if you make a public pledge, for instance, or a commitment, we're, we're quite keen to follow that through. So if you can introduce more space for people to make public pledges, even small ones or, or group pledges, it's more likely they then carry through that behavior. Likewise, there are opportunities to use networks to actually make it easier to um, maybe to do a particular um, environmental behavior. So it could be a coordination problem. Um, so for instance, if you have, off the top of my head, maybe if you had 50 people in, in a college ordering the same Domino's pizza every Saturday night, and you have 50 deliveries, if you just could coordinate somehow, um, you might have one delivery, that kind of thing. So other ways to coordinate using social networks. Likewise, in this example, probably not really relevant right now, but students at Elto University in Finland set up a food sharing um, network for food left over at meetings and parties during on campus, which has saved a large amount of waste. Again, kind of like a coordination problem. And we can use our networks to harness this. Likewise, Again, this is probably not particularly relevant in a college setting, although the con the, the, these concepts are quite relevant. But when, when social networks grow really fast, they tend to do so via referrals, peer referrals. Often the most trusted messenger is our friend, for instance. 
and ways that networks um, in the last few years have managed to get people to sign up and to get sign other people up is by offering them some kind of referral benefit. So if you get five people to sign up to Uber um, that's, and you get a benefit, you're probably going to be incentivized to actually go do that. But the idea of rec reciprocity is actually quite strong and it, it sort of sounds silly, but when you just do a small thing for someone, as we're quite social animals, we, we tend to like to repay the favor, even if that's in a quite small way. And here's an example of, of where a few years ago, we we're working with a charity trying to help or encourage um, investment bankers to donate a day's, pay, um, a day's pay to charity each year. And what we found in a trial, which long trying to testing things like the importance of messengers, the importance of saying thank you, um, the importance of, of maybe your, your boss suggesting you should do this. We simply um, gave people sweets at the beginning of the day in the office and said, here's some free sweets. Now please donate some to charity. And people did. And obviously, there's, it's not, you know, donating whatever um, they may earn is f worth far more than a pack of sweets. But that simple sort of reciprocity element is quite important. And, and we might be able to to build that into any other interventions that we, we do, even in a college setting. Okay, lastly, and I think, I hope I'm sticking to time, given that I'm, I'm talking about timeliness, but um, it does matter when you intervene. It really does. Um, well, we, actually, we'll talk about that in a sec, but first, it matters when you try and get people to decide to do something. So if you, if you can allow people to choose in advance, when maybe our sort of system two, our rational brain is thinking, um, maybe is, is dominating, then people tend to make different decisions than when they make them in the moment. So for instance, if I were to, if I was to plan what I'm going to eat next Thursday, I'd probably decide to eat something that I think is quite healthy and quite sustainable, maybe some kind of salad -y, non grained thing, I don't know. But when it comes to Thursday and I'm sort of slightly hungry um, and tired, maybe I sort of reach for a pizza. So if you allow people to choose in advance, and they did this um, in, in schools actually, and allow parents to pick what, to choose what their children would be eating at, in the canteen, people tend to choose more sustainable or, or more healthier options. So maybe this is something to think about. Um, I'm not sure how much meal planning is happening or is able to happen in, in college right now, but that is something to think about if you allow people to choose in advance. Also, kind of related to the same point, um, we often have a sort of a, a bias towards the present costs and benefits of something. So although we are aware that the future is really important and maybe our future health is important or our future finances are important, um, we're heavily weighted to, to what's happening right now in the present. So any way that you can kind of bring those future benefits into the present or the costs associated with doing something in the future, put those back into the future, more likely people maybe sort of invest that time or energy right now to do something green. So quite a nice example would be if you ask people to invest in their pensions and save money, it's quite hard for people to do that right now. But if you said to people, okay, what if every time you, you, your pay increased, you could invest a little bit into your pension? People are much more inclined to do that because it's like, well, it's future me anyway, so my future person can pay, but I can't do it right now. And lastly, if you're often enabling gradual changes, it's called kind of like the foot in the door technique, can, it, can encourage people to to continue on the path towards green and green behaviors. So if you start off small, you then like to be consistent, you think, okay, that's not too bad, I can do nothing and do nothing. So pre-commitments is quite important. Likewise, helping people plan is really important. Um, these are quite strong um, findings from elsewhere, way beyond just um, sort of green and sustainable behaviors. But generally, if you sort of write down how you're gonna do something, or even visualize that, how you might do it, you're much more likely to actually do it when the time comes. If, for instance, in another quite um, famous little study, if you give people when they arrived at university a little map showing where the clinic was, get a health checkup or register with the doctor, even though they're not going to do it right then, then and there, um, providing that information in advance makes it much more likely that those individuals later when they needed to actually went to that, get that checkup. Again, small things like checklists. So this could be for individuals to do, be like, being like, okay, these are the things that maybe you might want to do, have you ticked them off? Or even maybe when you're thinking um, in, through stuff like logistics, when you're planning maybe a big project, this could be, again, thinking off the top of my head, 
how are we ordering and so sort of organizing the supply chain or, or the whole um, sort of food for a term. Sometimes introducing checklists into that planning process can actually make things go a lot, more, a lot smoother and maybe have some sustainable results. Ah, okay. The last slide is not there, unfortunately. I don't know where, where when. But it's also really important when we intervene. So the slide I wanted to show, but seemingly missing, is at certain moments, we're more likely to act than at others. So if you looked at sort of gym signups, for instance, we people sign up to the gym at the beginning, beginning of the year, the beginning of the month, or the beginning of the week, for some reason. Um, likewise, we tend to form habits quite early on, maybe when, when we first arrive at, at term, and then we stick with those habits the rest of term. Maybe it's like the choice of where you sit in a lecture hall, obviously not now during COVID, but in the past, maybe you make a decision once and then you stick with it. So it's important to think about when to try and help people form habits and, and often trying to establish them as early as possible is really important, but also to acknowledge that when you have a refresh, maybe when you're coming back to the term, that's another moment where you can try and reestablish new habits. Um, in quite a nice experiment in Portland in, in the US, we're working on a, a cycle to work scheme, trying to encourage people to sign up to this bike scheme. And what we found was people who recently moved house to the area were much more likely, I think double, a little bit, I think four times as likely possibly, to sign up to the scheme. So they'd already been making this sort of big disruption in, in their travel habits um, already by moving to the area. And that's when it was much more likely that they would adopt this new behavior. So the key thing is that is to think about moments of change, disruption, or sort of new starts, and try and intervene and build habits at that point. So in summary, to sort of close this part of the session, if you want to encourage green sustainable behaviors, try and make them as easy as possible, try and attract attention or, or make the behavior attractive, harness our social inclinations and intervene in a timely manner when your intervention is gonna be most effective. Great, um, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. I think there's been a few questions coming in the chat, so I haven't been able to review them, but um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Zach. That was really interesting. Um, we already have one question here, but please uh, keep on coming with your questions. So the first question is, are rewards for containers better than making containers and other reusable options default? Are there best practices for encouraging reusables? That's a very good question. I don't have the answer. Um, it might be site context dependent. Um, things like, so, and it's, it's tr quite tricky to know how, how it works. So if you take the, the plastic bag example, in the UK, we introduced this, the 5p charge for a plastic bag a few years ago. Now, some people might say, well, and plastic bag uses have sort of dropped dramatically. Some people might say that's because people don't want to have to pay 5p and it's the cost of 5p that's stopping it. I, I might argue that that is probably important, but it's also you've changed the default setting from always having bags to now you have to ask for a bag. And that simple changing of the default, it's kind of implicitly telling people it's not normal to ask for a bag. It's kind of the exception. It's something you, don't, you, shouldn't, you only do if you sort of have to. And I'd probably argue that the change of the default and the information that sends is probably more important than the actual that sort of price change. But it's quite hard to work out the causality of that. Um, so it's, it probably is quite context dependent. Um, at the Behavioural Insights team, to answer questions like this, we'd say try and trial it if you can. So if, it, if you may be in one canteen or one area, you introduce the incentive and in one you introduce a default and then you try and compare how they differ. And that's probably the best way to find out. Cool. Thank you. Um, we've got another question here uh, from Ellie. Do you have any examples of using reciprocity in climate related areas? Um, again, good question. I'm sure there are. Um, I have to come back. I'll try and keep that working in the back of my mind to see if I can come back to it. And um, yeah, I'm sure there are, but I can't think of one right now. Um, got another question here related to reusables. Do you think a COVID will have setbacks for reusables 
and attitudes of reuse due to throwaway culture established for health concerns? I think possibly. Um, obviously, if you, it, habits are important. So if you build habits around maybe throwing away and using lots of plastic um, for COVID concerns, those might carry forward. The flip side I'd probably say is that I think COVID has also shown that our behaviours can change quite rapidly um, in sort of response to sort of change environment. So people can shift from everyone's going out doing lots of stuff to suddenly being at home um, in a quite rapid short period of time. So I think it's something to be maybe wary of, but I don't, um, I think we, we probably can quite quickly reestablish new norms as sort of people return to maybe normality or some diff different situation now. I guess it will be another kind of change uh, moment yes. uh, once we all return to uh, something resembling normal. <laughs> um, we have another question here around um, any tips for reaching the unreachable, people who say it's too late or they can't afford to improve their uh, environmental actions. Yeah, so I guess for those people maybe unreachable in that sense you aren't necessarily responding to awareness-based sort of messaging awareness-based campaigns that's probably where maybe you use different like framing so maybe okay rather than appealing to sort of a green motivation you appeal to health-based motivation or a so that could be with food for instance um maybe you highlight the sort of health-based benefits of particular um environmental foods or something like that or you don't necessarily think, okay, well, if I'm not going to persuade this segment, um, I'll try to influence behavior in a different way. So rather than try and persuade, just make it slightly easier to do it. Maybe you you try and change um, something in the process of, yeah, some maybe as an infrastructure change. I kind of would be under the inclination that if you put lots of recycling bins in Jeremy Clarkson's house, he probably would start to recycle if you took all the recycling bins away from uh, sort of a, an eco, um, a passionate eco warrior, they might find it harder to recycle and, and their might, motivations might not always come through. So yeah, if you wait for that, for that is those kind of people, maybe focus on the infrastructure changes. Right, so there are some kind of effects that apply across the board, however, whatever your intentions are. Um, Another question around the trade-off between sustainable behaviors or interventions and other concerns. Question from Lucy. Um, how do we balance some of these examples with needing to be accessible for those with disabilities or additional needs? Uh, so for example, uh, removing cups or straws or trays, um, how will this disproportionately affect certain students? Yeah, so that's a really good question, an important question. And the answer is, um, probably when you're designing an intervention to take these things into account where you can. So we do things like um, in Behavioural Insights team, a thing called a pre-mortem where you kind of um, imagine all the ways that um, the intervention that you're trying to do may like fail or, or may cause other problems and then you work backwards to work out how you can resolve those. And one thing we've been doing recently in government is trying to do this for policies related to public sector quality duties. So these are, these are things where um, particular groups sort of protected, have protected, character, uh, protected characteristics such as disability. Um, how does a policy affect that group? And if you sort of, in the planning process, think about all these things that hopefully would lead towards um, more inclusive interventions. Um, that's probably the answer. That's a, I don't necessarily have the answer of what to do about straws, for instance. Mm. Um, I guess in a, maybe my intuitive answer there would be uh, preserving choice might be important. So in that, I don't know, my intuitive answer to the straw thing is sort of allow, having the option of using a traditional straw or paper straw, um, but maybe having the papers the default as opposed to having the rule that you can use it or not, not having any other um, infrastructure available. Okay, yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Um, another question from Elifner, um, for social norm messaging, visibility is often a problem. 
uh, where studies showed participants do not even notice the message that communicates a dynamic uh, descriptive norm. How can we come up with creative ways to communicate social norms better rather than messages that are in text form? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it sort of works with, with how our sort of system one in intuitive decision-making is that we tend to follow signs that what other people have done. So for instance, the desire paths, the thing where people cut the corner. Often one of the reasons that we, we do that is that we've seen there's clearly a footprint that other people have done that. And we're like, oh, everyone else is doing it. We can actually see, literally see footsteps almost. So if there's ways to make those behaviors more visible without necessarily like using descriptive text or numbers, but simply sort of showing the choices that other people are making, that can probably be quite effective way of, of influencing behavior. A bit like how you can see the number of um, app downloads on the app store, that kind of thing, where it's a sort of, or number of listens on Spotify. Um, it's not, not necessarily seeing a text, well, I guess there is text, but any way that you can see, to so automatically see who's doing what, basically, um, it's probably more effective. But yeah, be creative if you can. Um, I'll take two more questions. Uh, one is from Paulina. What do you suggest for metrics for judging success and progress? Again, really good question, Paulina. Um, and it's really, the, the key thing here um, is, is you have to test what works to sort of know what works effectively. So what we do at the Payable Insights team, probably more important than applying behavior science to public policy is kind of introduce or helping to introduce the idea of evidence-based policy making where you, you run trials actually get gain evidence on what's working and that's kind of your judge for success so you would dictate that if you're running like an, a trial or experiment at the beginning you'd say what's our outcome measure maybe it's how many meals are chosen from this in this option how many cups are used maybe it's what people's attitude or awareness level is it's something you pick at the beginning then that's the thing you try and monitor at the end after you've done the intervention. Um, but wherever you can, measuring behavior rather than people's intention is more, probably more reliable, or is more reliable. Thank you. Um, and then the final question, which probably rounds us up quite nicely. What is the Behavioral Insight team working on at the moment? Yeah, so lots of things. Um, good question. I probably should have said this during the talk. It, we have lots of policy areas. So I work in the environment um, and energy and sustainability team. We also have the education team. We have the international development team. We have home affairs team, um, health team. So all these different like sort of key policy areas people are working on generally like most of the big challenges that we're facing. We have a, since March, we've had a COVID team um, trying to run, do a lot of research around um, maybe people's understanding of government messages, that kind of thing, or awareness of risk levels to try and pass the information on to the people who make decisions to be like, uh, this is maybe, yeah, this is what people's level of understanding is right now. So generally, we would say things that we describe as having social impact and sort of big, uh, high, highly important sort of social problems, we try and work on. Um, that's kind of our remit, I think. One question earlier about are students a less sustainable demographic? Some recent research from Pure Planet came out last week um, showing that I think while students, younger people, not necessarily students, young people tend to want to do more for the environment, actually currently older generations are doing more what we sort of do sustainable behaviours, so things like maybe recycling, that kind of thing. And I don't think it's the case that um, there's differences in sort of amount of people care or necessarily even things like awareness or there may be um but simply it might be easier for instance if you have quite strong routines if you have more maybe control over what you're choosing on a daily basis that kind of thing the actual physical environment around you that might be quite important so ways that that may that something for students to bear in mind ways that they could build routine and, and habit can actually be quite impactful we've probably just about reached the the time limit mm -hmm. Um, 
Right. Thank you everyone so much for coming and we will send round um, a follow up email with everything I mentioned, including this list of ideas that we've come up with. Um, and also this talk has been recorded, so um, it will be available in some form. So um, yeah, get in touch if you'd like to know more about that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Zach, for uh, sharing your wisdom with us and uh, thanks to all of you for coming and for all your good ideas. Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. Thank you, everyone. Bye.